Representative Cleaver, thank you so much for joining me. Good to be with you. Why don't we start off with uh, your background and uh, how you got to be where you are today? Well, I, I was born in uh, Waxley, Atchie, Texas, which in today in today's uh, interpretation of geography, it would be called a suburb of, uh, of downtown of Dallas. Uh, it's about a 25 minute drive from the house that I was born in to uh, uh, the Omni Hotel in downtown Dallas. Uh, but I grew up in a terrible, terrible uh, situation where, uh, you know, my, my father uh, had gotten a, a, um, a certificate uh, of accomplishment uh, in uh, dry cleaning. So he opens up a um, dry cleaners uh, in Waxahachie. Uh, at that time uh, in our nation's uh, history, uh, only African Americans would come to the cleavers cleaners, uh, and there were not enough of them with the money to pay for their cleaning. So my dad ended up cleaning half, half the black community's clothing for free because you know they couldn't pay. And uh, so we were living in a shack. My father uh, paid $5 a week for us to live in a house with no running water, no electricity, uh, no indoor plumbing. Uh, and uh, my mother, father, three sisters lived in, a house, in that house. Uh, I lived there for seven years. And then, uh, you know, when, when their economics were better, uh, we moved into public housing. Uh, we lived in public housing for about five years, and uh, my father worked uh, essentially three jobs saving money so we could move out of public housing. And he bought a house that was uh, in a in a uh, white area where they were building a uh, shopping center, mall, shopping mall. And so they were tearing down the houses there. And my father bought one of the houses before they tore it down for about $500, had it moved into the black community. Uh, and that house now stands uh, uh, today. Uh, my father will turn up 101 uh, on the 16th of uh, this month. And he is um, here in, in Kansas City. Uh, uh, but he was in that home until three years ago. And uh, it's sold. Another family is, is mo has moved in. So I, I had a, you know, a, you know uh, tough, but love, and I, I don't ever remember being hungry. Uh, I, and I was fortunate uh, to uh, play football, and because I played football, um, I had a scholarship and played at Morris State and uh, realized that, uh, you know, I was injured pretty bad. They had ACL and shoulder celebration. So I left after one year, went to Prairie View, uh, which is an HBCU near, near Houston, and uh, went out and played, uh, tried to play, uh, and uh, just couldn't do it anymore because of, of the injuries. And so uh, I did about a year and a half, uh, or a year and a quarter in college uh, football. And um, that's kind of the my, my uh, background and uh, ended up in Kansas City, Missouri after college. Uh, you know, I was going to stay for three years. I got a master's of divinity at the St. Paul School of Theology, and I uh, thought I was going to head back to uh, Texas and uh, met a young lady, and the next thing I knew, I was married with four kids and uh, couldn't leave. And then, uh, you know, about 18 years later, I woke up one morning, and I had been elected mayor of the uh, largest city in the state, so I thought, nah, I probably should stay. And uh, he went on after my eight years to, to uh, run for Congress at the urging of the uh, then member of Congress, Karen McCarthy. Uh, and then when Nancy Pelosi and Steve and uh, Nancy Pelosi, Steny Hoyer, uh, Ike Skelton started calling and so forth, I eventually uh, said yes. And here I am. So, you know, you spent time on the city council, I believe, and then you were mayor and then Congress. So, so what, what drew you down this path, you know, and, and how did it sort of connect with the Divinity School or was it a totally separate 
totally new direction you went in. What was the the thread between them? Is it all public service in your mind, or what what drew you into this path and and to keep yeah, going down it and go the national way? Everything is is absolutely connected. I grew up in a family uh, of uh, of uh, clergy, uh, and my my grandpa, uh, Reverend Noah Albert Cleaver, uh, preached up until his uh, until his nineties. Um, my uh, father's brother, my uncle, uh, preached into his 90s, uh, Leroy Cleaver Sr. My father's first cousin, uh, who we called Uncle, uh, Uncle Alden, preached uh, and, until his 90s. Uh, then I have cousins all over the state of Texas in the ministry. Um, I have uh, great uh, uncles. I have a great uncle. Luther Luther uh, Cleaver, who was a bishop in the Church of God in Christ in San, in uh, San Francisco, uh, Nancy Pelosi is familiar with. So um, I got involved in the civil rights movement uh, rather accidentally when I was 15 years old by uh, leading a group of about stup uh, of about 50 stupid kids who followed me at a time when you get you could get killed protesting and. Uh, we uh, attempted to desegregate the movie theaters, uh, which we, um, uh, we, we today we believe we, we, we caused it to happen a lot sooner than it would have. And uh, and so when I was involved with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and with my background in clergy, my, my, my family's background, uh, uh, it was inevitable. All I had to do is think about the Southern Christian Leadership Conference the president was Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, the second uh, uh, vice president was Reverend Ralph Abernathy. The executive director was Reverend Andrew Young, who also ended up in Congress and in, in the UN. Uh, then the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, uh, the Reverend Walter Fontroy, uh, Reverend Benjamin Hooks, and it goes on and on and on and on. Those are the people I was around, including Reverend uh, John Lewis, most people don't know. Uh, that uh, John Lewis uh, uh, is uh, uh, an ordained Baptist minister, uh, and uh, and so it it happened uh, as they say organically. Uh, you know, I, I woke up one morning and it seemed that that was the only course for me. That that, that uh, there was nothing else that I wanted to do. That there was nothing else that called me and pulled me relentlessly. Uh, uh, beyond what I was doing, which was, uh, you know, being a, a, a servant and a fighter for justice and and uh, peace and so forth, uh, because those guys I, that I grew up with, uh, you know, they, they were all pe uh, they believed in nonviolence. They they were peaceful, and coming from my family, where well, my cousin, uh, I have two cousins who are Black Panther members, one Elder Cleaver, who people are most familiar with. Uh, um, who had a bestseller of Solo Nice. He was minister of propaganda for the Black Panthers. And then uh, Pete O'Neill, the uh, Wall Street Journal, refers to him now as the last Panther. He's in exi uh, exile in, in uh, Africa, uh, in uh, Tanzania, uh, uh, not far from the from Kilimanjaro. So I have a re rather unique background. I could have gone either way. Uh, but I think uh, I went the way of nonviolence and peace, and uh, that's where I uh, intend to live out the rest of my day. Also, trying to make things happen, trying to make, trying to change things from bad to better. So you know, obviously, you you made this transition into the, you know, into politics, right? Um, local and then now national. You know, it's it's interesting. You know, your background. You know, what what drew you to this modernization committee? Because this, obviously this th series is about Congress as an institution and how we can improve Congress's performance as an institution, get ideas from people. You know what what drew you to this kind of modernization committee? You know it's not a typical kind of piece of the portfolio of a member, especially who's been around for a while and has lots of opportunities. You know what what drew you to this particular committee um, in Congress and 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 why that one compared to some of your other opportunities? Well, I, I, I tell you what. It, um... It, it was one of the most flattering moments in my political career uh, when uh, Nancy Pelosi, uh, the speaker at the time, uh, 
uh, summoned me to her office and uh, thought, boy, I'm in trouble. What, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I did uh, or what I didn't do. Uh, and uh, Nancy Pelosi is the kind of person you don't want to, she, you don't want to do anything that she doesn't want you to do. So um, I went to her office and she said, uh, you know, uh, based on all the things you've been doing since you've been here, I want you to uh, consider uh, the uh, Committee on Modernization. And she said, I want you there uh, primarily because of your work in civility. And she and what had happened was I, I was for, for years and years and years, Every week, I would send members of Congress a letter, everybody, on both sides of the aisle. Uh, and they were not attack letters. Uh, they were letters, uh, you know, pushing uh, theologically and, and in some instances, uh, you know, maybe it was subtle, there was subtle theology in it uh, and, and not evangelistic theology. It was uh, theology about how we treat each other. And so I had done that for years, and 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 both sides would get upset if they missed if I missed a week, uh, sending them the, the letter. I, I had people like Judge Poe, who, who just retired uh, from Congress Republican from Houston, who asked uh, every week his staff to read my letters. And they had to initial it that they had read it, uh, and then they get it back to him uh, at the end of the day. And there were a number of members of, uh, uh, who who required that their staff read. Uh, my uh, my little missile missile um, every week. So I said to, to Nancy Pelosi, "Absolutely, I, I, I want to do it." And I and I, it was uh, just one of the most fascinating uh, opportunities that I've ever had in my political uh, life. So you know, the the committee ran on for some time, right? Four and a half years, et cetera. Can you give a perspective on, you know, how has your view of this idea of modernization changed over that period? You know, when you started off versus when, you know, the committee obviously now is rolled in some form under administration. So during that span of time, you know, what was perspective from the beginning until until now? Has it changed? Is it the same as when you started? You know, what what's your overall perspective on it? Well, <clears throat> uh, I, I have never had the, the, the philosophy or the theology uh, that change was inevitable, that it's, that, uh, it's automatically uh, part of our existence. Uh, now, if you, you know, change will occur, you know, environmentally uh, and physiology, um, but I, I don't think change uh, changes in terms of, of, of attitude uh, automatically. Uh, I think uh, that the the change with human beings has to be pushed uh, ever so gently uh, into the minds uh, of, of men and women uh, to to the point where they they uh, they they give in, they succumb uh, to this notion that human beings uh, can be infinitely better than they are, and uh, and that we can treat each other uh, better. I mean that that, that war is. Uh, uh, you know, a Neanderthal uh, a desire. I mean, it's not it's not what we have to do as we are uh, uh, have, having come up with with uh, bombs that can destroy the planet and and uh, or ways in which we uh, can do enormous harm harm to each other unless we become more civil. And we we have historically led the. Uh, the, the the world, at least over the last 130 or 40 years, uh, in terms of military might, and uh, it it gives me you know some uh, great fear to think that some of the greatest empires in the history of, of the world uh, did not collapse uh, because of an attack uh, on the outside, uh, but they they rather collapsed from within. Uh, including the great Roman Empire. And so, uh, you know, the United States is an empire. We don't like to use that word today. It doesn't sound good uh, to us. Uh, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> but I would, I would suggest that the word united uh, in our name, uh, it, it could be a misnomer, uh, particularly um, if we uh, are... 
uh, headed in, in an antithetical direction. So would you say over the last four years then in your modernization, looking through the lens of civility anyway, you think it's declined, gotten better, stayed the same? No, no, I think, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> things are, are not going to, uh, change is not going to just roll in on the wheels of inevitability. Uh, they, they'd have to be brought about by our, our work and our commitment. And so uh, I've been in Congress now, moving toward 20 years, and um, I have seen a change uh, for the worse. Uh, when I was uh, elected uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, you know, there was um, uh, some hostility, uh, but um, it, it was uh, something that, you know, we, we could feel and we knew was not right, uh, but it was not all in uh, all consuming. Uh, today it is. Let me just share with you. <laughs> One of my dearest friends on the planet, and I'll say this anywhere on the, uh, in the world now, was uh, Christopher Kit Bond, who is uh, who, who is retired Republican senator from the state of Missouri. My friend, he is my friend. My Democratic little girl uh, went to Northwestern University. Um, was an intern in the office of Kid Bond. Uh, and, you know, uh, people, uh, you know, thought, you know, either you or, or Bond uh, is crazy. One, one of you guys, what's wrong with you? Uh, but when they did that, they were joking. And uh, uh, Kid and I joked about it publicly. We'd be in a number of speeches and, uh, Kid would talk about having come to my church and my sermons were so long that he had to bring a, a lunch and so forth. Uh, and then people would say, well, uh, the immediate news media, well, how, um, how did you and Cleaver become such good friends? And he said, I don't know, because we have uh, uh, differences that we just can't overcome. Uh, well, what are they, Senator? Well, he's a Methodist and I'm a Presbyterian. And so, uh, you know, people would crack up because they expect him to say, you know, well, he's a Democrat and I'm a Republican, or he's African American and I'm uh, Caucasian American. None of that. He 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 wanted to make sure people understood that our relationship was real. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm not sure uh, that some of these things can happen today. For example, and I'll do two two examples to you real quick. When Kit Bond uh, retired, uh, and his uh, retirement banquet here in Kansas City at Crown Center Hotel, I spoke, I, a Democrat, I did. I was in a room with, with a thousand Republicans or more. When I was elected to the House of Representatives on my first day after being sworn in, I had a reception given by Christopher Kidd Bond. Um, I think if you talk to people today, they'll say that, that in Congress, that, that that's just not going to happen anymore. Uh, and I think that until that becomes something that we can uh, feel and uh, is is just in an ordinary uh, way in which things are done, then uh, we we've got a problem, uh, and things are are, are going to get worse unless they get better. And I doubt seriously if any Democrat has spoken at any other uh, senator's uh, uh, retirement in the country. Uh, and then think about this. Uh, Tom Eagleton told his family, Senator Tom Eagleton from Missouri, told his family uh, during the time that he uh, his health was declining that he wanted the Reverend Jack uh, Danforth, an Episcopal priest who was also in the United States Senate as a Republican from Missouri, do his eulogy. And in fact, that's what happened. So, uh, you know, I think those days um, uh, are not being seen regularly around here now. I haven't seen anything like it in those 20, uh, 20 years since I've been here. So why do you think it's declined? You know, is it a general societal thing? Is it something specific to Congress? Is it social media, I guess, is, you know, in, from your perspective, right? And then 
from your also from your perspective, like what's the answer? Is it everybody has to initial your uh, your missives every day to get to get friendly? Is it they need to you know meditate before they get together? Is are the are the parties too tightly cohesive with themselves and turned into sort of a you know an inflexible in the way they deal with outsiders? You know when you think about the real cause and what do you think is the real solution? What, you know, what's your perspective? Uh, <clears throat> well, you know, when, when, when I first when I first came to uh, Washington, first went, arrived in Washington, um, I, I spent time with the house historian uh, who looked like he just stepped out of typecast. And I, I tell everybody, it's amazing. His office was over in the Cannon office book uh, uh, office building. I went over to see him. His hair was going in about thirty five different directions, and it was it was. Uh, uh, in the summer that I first went to his office, he had a wool a wool coat on plaid coat. It was probably 196 degrees uh, uh, that day here in Washington. Uh, you know, and he gave me a lot of reasons that he, that's not true. He gave me a couple of reasons that he believed were, were the causes. And, uh, and and one of the reasons he actually laid at the doorsteps of, of one of, the, uh, one of the, the, the political leaders at that time uh, he, he didn't think that that leader that, that leader realized what was being done, but he thought that someone had taken uh, a stance uh, and 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 therefore made a requirement of his side that they uh, embrace his stance, and 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 inevitably it led to a greater conflict. And then we and then what we had was. Uh, the the uh, the politics of retribution. In other words, when we were the majority, uh, you know, we uh, the other side said we oppress them, and then and, uh, when we went uh, when they win, we say that they are oppressing us, and and so every every uh, two years, uh, we frankly get tougher and tougher uh, on each other because uh, we feel like we've got to get back at the other side. Well, I mean, for example, there are people right now uh, who are in Congress who said to me, well, you know, you weren't here, but your side impeached Richard Nixon. And uh, and so we uh, reciprocated. That's why we went after Bill Clinton. Uh, and uh, I, doubt, I dare to say that in a few years, people are going to say, uh, well, you guys impeached Donald Trump, Trump twice. And and if, and if you, all you have to do is look at the fact that some of my colleagues, two of my colleagues, uh, have sought to introduce uh, articles of impeachment against Joe Biden, not because he stole anything, not because he uh, has been hiding gold that he took out of a, a, a gold mine in South Africa, but because uh, they have a different philosophical view of immigration. So, uh, I mean, that makes no sense. Uh, but that's that's where we're headed. It's it's, it's retribution, and um, I, I think one other reason that uh, that we are, are where we are uh, is that there is this belief, I, I think, among legislators uh, that our goal is to completely annihilate each other, uh, and. And so it starts with campaigns. Uh, when I was, you know, growing up, uh, you know, my mother was very deeply involved in politics uh, low, uh, at the local community. Uh, I don't ever remember seeing an ad, um, political ad, uh, on television. I'm sure there were a few, but they. And, and, and remember, when I was growing up, uh, we only had three. Uh, station. We had NBC, ABC, and CBS. And so, you know, it's not like we were just watching one channel. Everybody watched the same channel. And I'll talk a little bit about, about that in a minute, a little more about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, so uh, in campaigns, uh, there's uh, enormous pressure uh, for people to, to decimate your opponent. And so um, if you go out and, and start a, attacking your one's opponent in, um, in the campaign, I can assure you, I can assure you 
uh, that that's going to continue after you're elected. I mean, you can't you can't throw a, atomic bombs during a campaign and then uh, believe that everything is fine once you're sworn in. Uh, and so we, we have these thermo uh, nuclear um, campaigns these days uh, where anything goes, you know, we've got to destroy uh, the other side. And, uh, and hundreds of millions of dollars, not an exaggeration, hundreds of million dollars are spent every uh, quadrennium for the purpose of destroying the other side. <laughs> and, uh, and during the time when they're not actively involved in and uh, destroying each other on the other side, uh, they're raising money to do it, uh, or, or we're raising money to do it. And, um, you know, you get, you, you, unfortunately, you are measured Many, many, uh, many members of Congress are measured by uh, how caustic they can be or how offensive they can can be. Uh, I'll give you an example without a name. I can remember someone did something very public and and very inappropriate uh, at a State of the Union speech, and that person's uh, constituency spanked him by donating four million dollars over the next five days. Uh, for his reelect, so uh, that's uh, you know an example. We you know the you know we we created this um, a system of war. In fact, <clears throat> and I, I've said this to to, to uh, members of the media. Uh, why, why can't we look at some different language uh, in campaigns? Do we have to say? And the president attacked uh, his opponent today by saying this. I mean, the word "attack," I mean, is a is a is a phrase out of a uh, uh, you know vocabulary out of, of out of war. Um, and then we will, uh, you know, also uh, during the uh, the campaign, uh, uh, you talk about a war room. Uh, you know, and and it's the room where. You know, people sit around and plot and plan and scheme and come up with things that can do damage to the other side. Uh, now, I'm not saying that we haven't had these uh, uh, hard fought political uh, campaigns in the past. I mean, Lincoln and Douglas had a, 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 a you know, great uh, a war going, if you want to use the language of the day. But it was verbal, and they stood up and looked each other in the face, and and debated the issues, uh, and uh, you know there was no such thing back then uh, in in politics uh, that was uh, you know uh, des designed uh, to misinterpret uh, what your opponent said uh, to. To your favor, uh, and then we did not have cable TV, uh, where um, we 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 ended up with uh, negative news all day every day. Uh, and I know people in my hometown in Kansas City who get up in the morning and get some coffee. Uh, these are retirees, uh, and I can call names and give streets where they live. And they fill up, uh, they, they get uh, the coffee, sit down in front of a TV and watch for seven, eight hours a day, getting angry. Uh, and and, that, and uh, the, the purpose of, uh, of networks, in my estimation, is to make people uh, so angry uh, that they will come back the next day uh, and where, where it's almost like a, it's a drug, it's crack cocaine. They, they get up in the morning. They got to get this uh, this this news, uh, which is in some instances not even really news. It's not even accurate, uh, but uh, people see it as news. And so you go to Washington, and uh, anybody who sends somebody to Washington after having watched that thermonuclear uh, uh, campaign should come to conclude that he or she is going to be civil. I mean, there's. 
everything you've seen suggests just the opposite. And yet, that's what we do. I really believe that uh, when when you when we talk about how do we turn this thing around, it has to begin with television. It absolutely has to begin with the Johnson Amendment. Uh, we need to get I think where the the uh, uh, the Federal Communications Commission uh, would go back to the policy of saying uh, you have to have both sides of an issue. Uh, or if they, if I'm interviewed uh, 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 on a on a channel, uh, you got to interview my opponent, uh, and uh, we can't say that stuff didn't work because it brought us all these years uh, into the leadership uh, among nations, uh, and, and and we did that, uh, you know, giving opponents the same opportunity to say their opinion, uh, and and. Uh, you know, so we are we are pushed by uh, you know the the cable channels, and think about this. <clears throat> I, I've been on TV a lot. I, I you know one year I, I was on Meet the Press three times, uh, which is big for for a member of Congress. Uh, and uh, well, I, I've had years when I did many, many, many. Uh, interviews um, and uh, not one time uh, during the, that uh, interview uh, uh, did the person uh, interviewing me uh, editorialize. You know, in other words, you know, they asked me a question and they, they give me a, a part of the answer. Uh, we. Uh, that's 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 hurting us, and the only way you get on TV a lot is to say a lot of dumb, stupid things. Uh, I, look, I if I want to be on 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 uh, uh, Meet the Press and Face the Nation this weekend, uh, and uh, you know maybe even uh, State of the Union, uh, uh, I can do it. I, I have the ability to do it. I'm. I'm, I'm reasonably articulate, so I can I can think about some really really ignorant things I could say. Uh, call somebody a, a, a horse, uh, you know, a, an elected official. Call him or her a horse uh, or a, a doggy, and 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 and, and there I am. And so the media has a role, uh, and, and I, I and that's to present the news. But it also has a responsibility, uh, and that is uh, uh, to present uh, facts to the nation. Uh, nobody questions John Jean, uh, John Chancellor, uh, Huntley Brinkley, or Walter Cronkite. I mean, those guys did everything they could to come across right down the middle. Yes, you know, you mentioned uh, in the beginning the leadership, you know, and then you talked about the media. You talked about the people's response, right? So it sounds like there's multiple levels here that have to be, you know, improved to or changed to make the environment more civil. Does that kind of sum up the, the way you think about it? Yes, it's the politician and those who put politicians in office. Uh, we, 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 we both are going to have to change. And I think the way we change uh, some of that is, of course, having a, a nonpartisan media. Uh, you know, where where the, the including on on cable, that's not going to happen. But uh, if I had my druthers, if I if I had the uh, ability, I, I I would order that to take place uh, before the six o'clock news tonight. So beyond civility, and when you when you dealt with the modernization committee, you know there are two hundred more than two hundred recommendations made. You know. Yeah, which of those outside of the civility area do you feel like are important and need to be pushed forward? And which ones do you feel like need more investigation or you're a little bit, you, you think need deeper dives? Well, it, 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 let me, first of all, um, just violate uh, my, my uh, claims of trying to to be thoughtful about others and, and, and deal right now with one of my pieces of legislation. Uh, we, we are, uh, we've been talking about it since uh, the, the uh, committee was formed, and I, I've got a, a, a brilliant staff, and they've been working on it. It's called dual sponsorship, 
uh, and uh, as you as you may know, uh, because we're so politically polarized, that if I'm in the majority, uh, I introduce all legislation, even if I have a co-sponsor, uh, I am still the sponsor. And the co-sponsor is uh, uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, is, ne is never gonna be considered uh, as the sponsor of the legislation. He or she is just riding along, taking a, they, they, they agree with it and support it, but they're along for the ride. They can't get uh, any credit uh, at all. Um, and, and and so what we're uh, moving toward, we hope, and, uh, and Derek Kilmer, the chair, uh, and Mr. Timmons are both fantastic. I, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm digressing, but the, 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 we couldn't have had two, two better chairs. They work together, they're not trying to, uh, you know, make each other look bad and so forth. Uh, but we we need to have dual sponsorship. Just think if if if, if a lot of the bills that uh, reach the, the the resolute desk uh, in the White House had a Republican and a Democratic person uh, as sponsors, man, that just almost uh, immediately wipes out uh, the, the some of the national hostility. You know. I mean, these guys are together. You know, I want to want to hate somebody, but I, these guys are together, and maybe, maybe I can hate the ties or something. Uh, you know, but uh, I, I think for for me, that's that's one of the things that uh, that uh, could be done, and that's and that's not necessarily anything civil. Uh, and I, I think um, you know we, we've got to. Uh, I, I, I think uh, figure out how um, to handle incoming classes. Um, and we say classes, incoming uh, members of, of uh, the House of Representatives. And I, I've said this in our committee, at, at, at many of our um, meetings uh, of the uh, select. Uh, committee on modernization. That when I was when I was elected, I was put on a bus uh, with all the other elected Democrats, and we were out in front of the Capitol. And fifty feet down in front of us is another bus, and it is the bus of newly elected Republicans. And our bus went one way, and the other bus went the other way. And so, if you get on that bus, and you're here in Congress and not realize what's going on, you come to the conclusion rather easily and quickly uh, that you're supposed to be going in the opposite direction no matter what. Uh, and um, I think right off the bat, we need to make sure that uh, the new members have every opportunity uh, to be uh, uh, just inundated with information about uh, civility. Uh, and bipartisanship, uh, and uh, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I, I know uh, some of the leaders probably don't want that. They 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 want warriors, and uh, I, I just think we start off. We should start off with things. I wouldn't even care if if, if uh, we held up voting for the first uh, two weeks of the new session. Unless we are, you know, a war or, or something that, that that would would prohibit us from doing it, but I think the first two weeks of of, of, of every new class of members coming into to the United States House of Representatives, if they are uh, they are uh, working together uh, on something, uh, you know, even going bringing their families up and 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 being social with each other, um, and I. I I, 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 that leads me to uh, a little bit more. Uh, in days gone by, uh, my my uh, member of Congress was uh, Richard Bowling. Uh, he uh, he ran uh, the Rules Committee. I, I say ran, I mean he ran the Rules Committee for decades, and uh, was one of the most powerful people in Washington. Uh, and and I and I liked uh, the representative. I didn't I, I didn't get a chance to know him well because 
he like Tom Eagleton, our senator, and he like Stuart Symington, and he like uh, Senator Graham and all others uh, moved to Washington when they were uh, elected. And they moved their families to Washington. And they all lived over there on Capitol Hill. And so their kids went to school together. Uh, their, uh, the, the family members went to PTA meetings together. They played Little League uh, baseball and football together. Uh, on weekends, uh, the members played golf together uh, and juxtapose, juxtapose that with today. Everything is designed to take people in the opposite direction. And I think uh, one of the things that, that, that we uh, discussed in, in, the, in the committee was exactly the opposite of what I just said, practicing the exact opposite of what I just said, trying to get people uh, to start out uh, realizing that, that nothing gets done unless we work together. And then secondly, uh, that we can actually become friends living in the same neighborhood, uh, living, uh, you know, in close proximity to everybody else in, in uh, Congress. And uh, I think uh, it makes it a lot easier uh, uh, to call somebody a nasty name uh, if you don't know their children. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, it's infinitely more difficult if, if, if Billy and, and Ted, your kid, are on the same little league team. And you, you, you know, you call a nasty name, and boy, that's, I mean, it's disruptive in the whole neighborhood. So I think there are a lot of little things that we talk about. I'm talking about mainly the things that I lifted up right now, but uh, th there were many things like that that, that uh, I truly believe, and the committee believe could, uh, could, could um, bring about a dramatic change. Uh, but they, I think there are many people on the committee, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, didn't want to come out with, uh, you know, just a whole pile of things that might cause some some tension from leadership. Yeah, I mean that's a question I have about debate, deliberation, dialogue, right? How what's the best way to make that happen in Congress? Where should it happen? You know, you can have it on the floor, you can have it in committee, you can have it in a dorm, right? Uh, with all the with members living in a dorm or in the neighborhood at the local restaurant. In, in your kind of history, in your perspective. Where is the best place to have this debate, this deliberation, this dialogue? Should it be in the open? Should it be private? Should it be in the committee? Should it be on the floor? Should it be in the neighborhood? Well, it, it can be public, I don't think, because it, it, it's, it's being in public that will cause people to, um, you know, go to, to, to go into something disruptive and something that will get them some uh, attention. Uh, I have colleagues who believe that we, we, uh, we actually uh, made a mistake when we allowed C-SPAN to televise. I tend to think that the C-SPAN uh, televising of our committee hearings and, and our uh, um, meetings in, in, in the, the uh, House uh, on the floor are good things. We, the public needs to see that. I, I, I think, it, I think it, it, uh, it's a good demonstration of, of uh, what democracy is. Uh, but I also think that uh, we ought to have um, even more stringent rules uh, for how we uh, speak on the floor. Um, you know, I mean, you can look. I've spoken at at, uh, at three of the last four conventions, and I, I challenge anybody who watches this tape go and at any of the last conventions. And I've given some fiery speeches uh, on, on, uh, at conventions. Why, how do I know they were fiery? Uh, because of the response of the audience had people on their, on their knees. I have never, in three speeches on, on the floor uh, at the Democratic Convention, said the word Republican. Not one time. Uh, I have not uh, called uh, 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 anybody's name. Um, uh, even with uh, when I talked about uh, Barack Obama in my in one of my speeches, I, I kept saying, "Mr. President, um, you know, 
don't give up hope. Hope on. Hope on, Mr. President. And, and um, so I know that we can be passionate uh, and tough uh, with our language and still not be insulting to the other side. So those are all amazing points and I think so relevant for the country and for and for Congress. Um, you know, I'd like to ask you a slightly different question around this notion of representation, because some people, I guess, when they when they are inflammatory, right, they think they're representing some group, right, in their constituency. So I'm I'm curious about how you approach this notion of representation for a diverse district, right? You know, different kinds of people in a district, 700,000, 800,000 people. Um, what's your perspective on representation? You know, do you feel like you're representing, you know, the you know, the, the primary voters, are you, are you representing, you know, the, who, you know, who got you in? Are you representing everybody? Are you thinking about future generations? When you think about how, when you come into Congress and you, you think you represent these people, who are those people in your mind that you, that you, you kind of conceive of? And then on the other side, how do you represent them? Are you, you know, voting the way you think they would vote? Or are you kind of making your own judgments about what you think is in their best interest in the long run? If I could have planted a question, uh, for this uh, convers conversation, that would have been it, uh, what you just asked, uh, because I think this is right at the center of it. Uh, look, I represent a, a, a congressional district, the 5th District of Missouri, uh, where I've rarely had more than 18% African-American uh, constituents. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, I've been elected quite a few times. Uh, and so um, the natural question is, am I designing my uh, political philosophy? Am I uh, writing my political speeches uh, so that uh, one group will um, embrace it? Uh, and therefore uh, continue to propel me in the public office that I'm speaking with them. I had, uh, until redistricting, what I considered the congressional district that every single member should have. And uh, in Missouri, Kansas City is the largest city. And uh, here's, here are the other places that I represented. Oric, Missouri, 800. Sweet Springs, Missouri. Uh, less than a thousand. Slater, home of Steve McQueen, but uh, less than a thousand uh, people, so much so that the city hall is in the grocery store. Um, Concordia, Lexington, uh, Richmond, uh, Oak Grove, uh, Higginsville. So I'm representing significant portion of the largest city in the state, all the way down uh, to Malty Bend with 300 people. So it was a challenge, but I, 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 I thought, okay, here's a chance for me to go out into the rural parts of Missouri and speak to uh, the people there um, uh, about uh, the the relationship they have with each other, uh, that in, in, a, in a real way, we're all connected. Uh, and let me break it down a little bit more. Farmers are growing um, crops to sell and make money. The people in the USDA, United Department of Agriculture, are buying those products. And in the transactions and all of the subsequent actions, we come up with a program called SNAP, uh, where poor people get a chance uh, to get some assistance in, in uh, purchasing of, of the products that those farmers have been growing. Um, the farmers realize that uh, and, and, and uh, formed an allegiance with the Hispanic and the Black uh, caucuses uh, that they wanted, uh, that they would never support the farming leaders 
in the country, in the United States, that will never support a an ag bill that does not include uh, food uh, subsidies for the poor. And that's why we've been able to get a farm bill. And here's an African American, uh, uh, a big city African American member of Congress, endorsed by every single farming organization in the state of Missouri. Every one of them. Uh, and 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 how does it happen? Well, number one, I don't go out and have I don't have a farming speech, and then a city speech. And I think you know that duplicity is what get, has gotten us into trouble before. And so I will say uh, in in the rural areas uh, that there's a symbiotic relationship between the farming community and the urban core. Uh, in in uh, urban America. Uh, there's a great deal of poverty that, that has this uh, pride that they don't want to admit it. But all you have to do is look at the number of kids on the free lunch program in, in St. Louis. <laughs> and, and then look at the number of students, uh, percentage-wise, in those small towns. And so uh, there are more poor kids eating uh, the, the lunch program in, poor, in the rural areas than in the urban core. Statistically correct, what I just said. And, and, and the evidence is, is available, USDA. So we have a lot in common. Why in the world would we waste our time um, fighting each other? Uh, one of the great joys of my life occurred last Saturday. Um, I, su I supported a, a, I represented a town called Marshall. Uh, it's you know, almost 100 miles away from Kansas City. And last week, uh, I was invited to come down and speak uh, at a banquet. And the people used that opportunity to, to, to tell me. One guy came up and said, uh, you know, we, I, I could have given him some better language, but, you know, we, we can take care of that later. He said, I was really upset when they told me I was going to have an inner city member of Congress representing us. And he said, uh, "I thought this is this is just horrible. How can they do this to us?" And he said, uh, "I just want to just let you know uh, that this is one of the best things that has happened to to to, uh, to us." And I had a number of people at the bank, where, including the people who presented me with an award, you know, say, "Look, you've been more available and accessible uh, to us than any any a member of Congress in our uh, uh, in our lifetime." Uh, that's not. I'm not bragging about me. I'm trying to design in the minds of people uh, ways in which we can work together. And the truth of the matter is how we all have desires and hopes and goals and dreams. And I think, uh, it, 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 you know, maybe we have to bend to understand the other side. But if that's what's required, then that's what we ought to do. And, you know, I'm willing to, to do that. I've been redistricted now and put it almost exclusively in Kansas City. But for the last decade, uh, and, and many of those farmers, they were surprised that I could speak uh, country. Uh, you know, I was born, as I said at the opening of this, in Waxahachie. And so I, my grandpa on both sides were farmers. So I can speak farm. And uh, they were surprised uh, that this city slicker, uh, you know, could, could speak farm. Excellent. The last question is really about, um, you know, kind of the next 50 years. If you could change something fundamentally, what what fundamental institutional improvement should Congress make? Is it a civility question? Is it the dual question? Do you have something else big that you think could be implemented within a 50 year time frame that would really change the game for the better for Congress as an institution? Well, look, we're the, we're the, we're the most powerful military force that has ever occupied the earth as we as we understand the earth. Uh, and the chances are all, almost zero that uh, we can be matched militarily uh, in, in this world. We are a superpower. We are an empire. Uh, um, and, and so uh, while we can maintain a strong military, and I agree with uh, support, uh, support doing that, uh, but when we start spending at least half the money uh, that we're spending on the military inside uh, the United States domestically, uh, working on uh, on us, 
on, on, on ways in which we can turn down uh, the volume uh, of our disagreements uh, and, uh, you know, where we can get the, the, the public uh, to buy into people who are decent um, and, 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 and make people, get people to understand that civility and ethics uh, in government at least um, equals patriotism. That, that you're a patron uh, in the way you speak to your uh, fellow countrymen and women. Uh, and, you know, we are now legislating in the more and the most um, uh, severe strain uh, against democracy, strain on, on democracy that we've ever had. And so uh, I, I would think that you know, if we if we have all of these um, academies where members of Congress uh, recommend uh, young people to attend uh, West Point and Naval Academy outside of Washington and Coast Guard Academy, Air Force Academy, we have all of these academies, but we do not have a peace academy. We do not have uh, a, a, an academy that that is de designed exclusively uh, uh, to, to provide peace, or work on peace, uh, or to promote peace uh, in this and domestically. I mean, you know, there ought to be. I mean, everybody ought to desire to be the the, the Martin Luther King, the Dalai Lama, uh, you know, the the person. Uh, who is, uh, you know, grounded in 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 uh, in, in peace and and uh, how we work together? We understand that democracy that democracy demands compromise, and and so uh, we ought to work on how 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 to compromise. Uh, and, and in many ways, if, if people get married, they're going to learn. Uh, it's a painful lesson if you wait then, but. You know, we, if we had an institution that that promoted peace and and uh, and, and the ways in which we could work together, I think uh, it would be a, just a matter of time. Uh, it will take time, but we can turn this thing around. God has been so good to the United States. However, one might see God uh, as a woman, a man, or uh, the the supreme being, whatever. Uh, we have been just so uh, immensely blessed that we owe it to ourselves uh, 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 and our progeny uh, to create uh, a civil world. And we cannot have a civil civil nation uh, until we have a civil homes. And then we can't have that unless we have civil government. And right now we don't have it, but we can get it if we have enough people committed. Excellent. Well, uh, Congressman Cleaver, thank you so much for the inspiration and the hard work and the time today. So uh, best of luck to you moving forward with your forward bill with you. and uh, with the committee and with Congress moving forward. Good to work with you. Thank you. Thank you.